All right, so tonight we're going to continue with hazardous materials operations. And tonight we're going to talk about lesson seven, control zones and decontamination. All right, so let's review what our initial actions are and then move into control zones. So we're gonna, when we get called for a call, we're gonna perform a size up. As soon as we get the call, hopefully, if this is a fixed facility, we've done a pre-plan. If not, we will start our size up as soon as we receive the call. We're gonna get on scene. We're gonna size up the incident, establish command, role and safety role. And first we're going to isolate. How do we get the information we need in order to isolate? That's with the ERG, Emergency Response Guide. If there are any victims present, we're gonna direct them to a safe location to await decontamination. And you need to also prevent victims from leaving the scene. You also need to come up, start thinking about how you're going to evacuate uncontaminated persons from the hazard area. So there may be people who are contaminated and some people who are not contaminated. The people who are not contaminated, you need to control them as well. They still may need medical care. Those people who are contaminated, they needed to be decontaminated before they receive medical care. Let's talk about some terms, isolation perimeter. This is the outer boundary of an incident that is controlled to prevent entrance by the public. So this, the isolation perimeter means nobody who is not part of the response is allowed inside this perimeter. This is a big deal. Um, and it's not, and it's sometimes, it's, often it's a afterthought, This allows the incident responders to do their job and not be hindered by the public, the media, um, or anyone else who doesn't need to be there. So how are you gonna do that? Usually with the assistance and cooperation with police. Next, we move on to initial isolation distance. This is the distance within which all pe persons should be considered for evacuation in all directions from the actual spill or leak source. So this is that circular area, circular shaped area that we want to get everybody out of. Nobody goes in there. This is the also called the hot zone, but we determine the hot zone with the initial isolation distance. The initial isolation zone, also called the hot zone, the EPA call, calls it the initial uh, the initial isolation zone. Isolation zone. This is again the circular zone with a radius equivalent to the initial isolation distance. Remember, people may be exposed to dangerous concentrations up wind of the source. Okay, maybe dangerous upwind from the source. Yes, that's what I mean. Also, they may be exposed to life-threatening conditions downwind of the source. So that's why we isolate in a circle. Protective action distance. We started talking about this when we learned how to use the emergency response guidebook. The protective action distance is the downwind distance for which protective actions should be considered. What are protective actions? They are either evacuation or shelter in place. Use the ERG or some modeling software to determine that. This is downwind from the source, and then on both sides of that distance, half that distance. 
That's your protective action distance. You need to decide whether to evacuate or shelter in place. The protective action zone is the area immediately adjacent to and downwind from the initial isolation uh, zone. So this is the area that is in imminent danger of being contaminated by airborne vapors within 30 minutes of material release. So remember in the ERG, in the blue and yellow sections, the materials that are listed and that are highlighted are considered toxic inhalation hazards. Those are the materials that you then go to the green section to determine the protective action distance. And when I said you go left or right of that, that's the protective action zone. When you combine the distance and spread it out left or right of that, that's your protective action zone. So here's a good example. So you have your spill in the center there. You have your initial isolation zone and then your protective action distance is downwind from the center. And then half that distance left and right. And that encompasses your protective action zone. There you go, you, that creates your protective action zone. So we've got some hazard control zones, some terminology here. These are the zones dividing the levels of a hazard of an incident. We usually call these hot, warm, or cold. These are the colloquial terms. The EPA has some other names for them. For what we call the hot zone, they call, the EPA calls the exclusion zone, which means nobody in, right? The warm zone is the contamination reduction zone, and the cold zone is the support zone, according to the EPA. Remember, once we get on scene and we're doing our size up and we're setting up our command structure and we're trying to do that isolate, identify, and notify portion phases of our hazmat response, all we have is our hot zone or exclusion zone and the cold zone, excuse me, the support zone. That's all we have, hot and cold. The warm zone is then created by taking up part of the cold zone for the decontamination corridor. So once we set up the decontamination corridor, that creates the warm zone. And we create that by taking away part of the cold zone. It becomes warm because we're actually bringing, possibly bringing materials from the hot zone out of the hot zone. And so since it's hopefully getting less and less hazardous, that's why it's called the warm zone. In the hot zone, PPE is always required. No questions. Personnel must always work in the buddy system and all personnel equipment must exit through the decon corridor. Okay. If someone enters the hot zone, they have to wear PPE. You have to have a partner, at least two people. And if you're in the hot zone, all your equipment and all personnel must exit through the decon corridor. In the warm zone, PPE is also always required. The PPE of the people who are working in decontamination group generally wear one level below the hot zone, generally. Keep in mind, this is a buffer between the hot and the cold. Okay, this is where we do decon. This begins as a clean area. The only contaminants in this area should be due to the decon process. 
We're bringing it out of the hot zone into the cold zone through decon. And that's the only way they should be getting into this area. The cold zone is a clean area. No PPE is required. And we're talking about chemical protective PPE. Great care must be taken to prevent contamination of this zone. So you have, to, anybody goes in the hot zone, potentially contaminated, has to exit through decon to remove that contamination. The command post and other support functions are put in the cold zone. Let's talk about some more definitions. The decontamination zone is the warm zone where contaminated clothing, people, and equipment can be cleaned or secured. An area of safe refuge is a safe location, or you could have multiple locations where evacuated persons are directed to gather while potential emergencies are assessed, decisions are made, and mitigating activities are begun. So when you arrive on scene, you have people who were in the hot zone. You can't just let them wander around, but you also can't leave them in the hot zone, continuing to be exposed by the hazard. So you have to get them, if they are ambulatory or able to walk, you need to get them to move to a safe location. They need to be upwind, uphill from the spill, but downwind and downhill of you. I can't tell you where that is. That's the best advice I can give to you. So you'll have, depending on the situation, you'll have to determine what that is. Staging area is where personnel and equipment await assignment to this uh, waiting assignment to the incident are held. Um, this minimizes confusion and freelancing at the scene. If you just have people standing around um, too close to the scene, they're going to want to get involved and you might not be ready for them. Where you put staging is located in an isolated spot in the cold zone where occupants cannot inf interfere with ongoing operations. The rehabilitation area is another safe location where emergency personnel can rest, sit or lie down, have food and drink and have medical conditions evaluated. This is also located in the cold zone. There's also the triage treatment, treatment area where victims of an incident are brought for medical assessment, which is triage and stabilization, the treatment located in the cold zone unless a patient is contaminated, then it would have to be in the warm zone. So what is contamination? This is the process of transferring a hazardous material from its source to people, animals, the environment, or equipment. So we're moving it, transferring it from one place to another. That is contamination or contaminating. Decontamination is the process of removing hazardous materials to prevent the spread of contaminants beyond a specific area and reduce the level of contamination to levels that are no longer harmful. When do we do it? It's performed when a victim, responder, animal, or equipment leaves the hot zone. Exposure is the process by which people, animals, the environment, and equipment are subjected to or actually come in contact with a hazardous material. Remember, you can take contamination with you, but you cannot take exposure. Exposure means you have the chance of experiencing the harm of the hazard of the material. Contamination just means the material is on something that it wasn't on before. Hazard is the harm that can be done by the hazardous material. So that would be the thermal, radiological, asphyxiant, chemical, ideological, and mechanical harm. And that's what we use to determine our PPE.
primary contamination is the direct transfer of a hazardous material to person's equipment and the environment. This occurs in the hot zone. So primary contamination always happens in the hot zone because of direct contact with a hazardous material. So primary contamination only happens in the hot zone. It's when something goes into the hot, the hot zone or was there when it began to not be in its container anymore. And that's where the contact happens with the material. Primary contamination happens in the hot zone. Secondary contamination is the contamination of people or equipment or the environment outside the hot zone. The contaminant is carried from the hot zone by personnel's clothing or tools, air currents, and runoff water. If personnel are not decontaminated before leaving the hot zone, they can contaminate whomever and whatever they touch thereafter. So secondary contamination happens outside the hot zone. What's outside the hot zone? The warm and cold zones. So secondary contamination only happens in the warm or cold zones. So you have something or someone who enters the hot zone, comes out, and then spreads that contamination. When that contamination is spread outside the hot zone, that is secondary contamination. Surface contamination is the what it says, the contamination of the surface of a material. It does not perme per penetrate, permeate, or soak into whatever it's on. It just sits on top of it. Surface contamination. Then there's permeation contamination. This is penetration of a contaminant below the surface of something. All right, let's talk about decontamination, some general methods. There is wet decontamination, which is washing the contaminated surface with solutions or flushing with a hose stream or safety shower, usually necessitates the collection of runoff water in wading pools or other liquid retaining devices. Remember, we have a responder who is in their chemical protective suit and they have been contaminated, primary contamination in the hot zone. They come out, they come through the decon corridor. And if we use water to decontaminate them, that water is now contaminated, secondary contamination. We can't just let it go wherever, we also have to collect it. Another type of general decontamination is dry. Dry decontamination involves scraping, brushing, and absorption. Maybe as simple as removing contaminated clothing and putting it into a storage bag. Uh, obviously, it does not create large amounts of contaminated runoff. You can get quite a bit, the majority of contamination off of someone by just removing their clothing. But remember, that clothing is contaminated, so it has to be contained as well. There's physical decontamination. This removes the contaminant from a contaminated person without changing the material chemically. And the contaminant is contained for disposal. So this would be like washing something off, brushing something off. It doesn't change the material chemically. It's still the same chemical. It's just not on where we don't want it to be. And there's also chemical decontamination. This, we use this to make the contaminant less harmful by changing it through some kind of chemical process. Now we're going to get specific ways of decontaminating. So we're gonna talk about dry decontamination. One way is vacuuming. Just use a high efficiency particulate air filter, HEPA filter, uh, on a va special vacuum cleaner to suck up the solid materials such as fibers, dust, powders, and particulates from surfaces. 
you do have to have a special vacuum to do that. Absorption, decontamination, you can pick up uh, liquid contaminants from absorbance. Now, keep in mind, this is a considered a dry decontamination, which means we are not adding water to it. So we can still pick up liquid contaminants. So they're wet, but our decontamination process is dry. We can absorb the material. Advantage to using absorbents, they're inexpensive and readily available. Uh, so examples could be soil, diatomaceous earth, vermiculite, sand, pigs, pillows, booms, or other commercial products. Limitation, absorbents do not alter the hazardous chem chemical, so which means the hazardous chemical is still hazardous. Absorbents may have limited use on protective clothing and vertical surfaces. Absorbent disposal may be a problem because again, the chemical hazardous material is still part, now, now it's on whatever absorbent we used. It's not any different. It's just not where it was. Brushing or scraping, this is removing large particles of contaminant or contaminated material such as mud from boots or other PPE. Um, this is usually not sufficient decontamination. Um, it doesn't do it completely. So, you, but you use this before other types of decontamination. You're gonna get the majority of off by brushing or scraping, and then you're gonna follow up with other types of decontamination. So that's the dry decontamination. Now we're gonna move on to type wet types. Remember dry just means we are not adding water or any other liquid chemicals. Wet decontamination, uh, we'll start off with dilution using water to flush contaminants and diluting water soluble hazards, hazardous materials to safe levels. So remember that's water soluble hazards. If it's not water soluble, then using water, you're not going to dilute. You may be able to flush, but you're not gonna be able to dilute. The advantage is the accessibility, speed and economy of using water. We have water all around us. Um, it's relatively inexpensive and we can move it pretty efficiently uh, with a fire truck. Limitations using water and dilution. Water may cause a reaction and create even more serious problems. As we've learned, uh, there are some materials that are water reactive. We don't wanna be adding water to those. Also, runoff water from the process is still contaminated and must be confined and then disposed of properly. Washing is similar to dilution, but also involves using prepared solutions such as solvents, soap, and or detergents mixed with water in order to make the contaminant more water soluble before rinsing with plain water. Again, we need to make sure that whichever these prepared solutions we choose is compatible with the material. Moving on to physical decontamination, this involves adsorption. Previously, when we were soaking things up, it was ab, A-B-S, absorption. This is adsorption decontamination. An example would be charcoal process in which a hazardous liquid interacts or is bound to the surface of a sorbent material. This is a little bit different than just soaking up in a sponge or a dry absorbent pad. This is, we're using a, another chemical to bind the hazardous material to its surface at the molecular level. There's also evaporation. Evaporation decontamination can be accomplished by simply waiting long enough for a hazardous materials to evaporate. That's also a possibility. If it has a high vapor pressure, the liquid has a very high vapor pressure, then it's going to evaporate rather quickly and is no longer hazardous. Now we're moving on to chemical decontamination. So there's solidification. It's a process that treats a hazardous liquid chemically 
so that it turns into a solid. Uh, many times um, hardware stores will sell something, uh, a chemical that does this for paint. So you can dispose of uh, leftover unused paint safely. There's also chemical degradation, using another material to change the chemical structure of a hazardous material. So some common, commonly used materials is household bleach, isopropyl alcohol, hydrated lime, household drain cleaner, baking soda, liquid detergents. Keep in mind that this is a chemical reaction. Remember, there's exothermic and endothermic chemical reactions. If you just if you choose to use one of these chemical degradation materials, you could potentially be creating an exothermic reaction, which is going to create heat and possibly not only damage the PPE that the person's wearing but could also harm them as well. The advantage to chemical degradation, it can reduce cleanup costs and the risks exposed, opposed to first responders because the original material is no longer chemically the original material and therefore its hazards are no longer present. The limitations, it takes time to determine the right chemical to use and set up the process. It also has how much do you use? Again, this is a chemical reaction. It's like a recipe, you have to use the right amount. It can be harmful to first responders if the process creates heat and or toxic vapors. Neutralization is changing the pH of a corrosive, either raising or lowering it towards seven on the pH scale. There's also sanitization, disinfection, or sterilization. Each one is different levels of decontamination. Sanitation reduces the number of microorganisms to a safe level. So sanitation reduces the number to a safe level. Disinfection kills most of the organisms present. Kills most of the organisms present. Sterilization kills all the microorganisms present. We either use chemicals, steam, heat, or radiation. So sanitation reduces, disinfection kills most, sterilization kills all. That's the difference. All right. Now we've talked about the different types of decontamination. Now we're going to talk about um, the process. Emergency decontamination. This is removing contamination on entry team personnel in potentially life-threatening situations with or without the formal establishment of a decontamination corridor. This is a type of gross decontamination. So emergency decontamination. We perform that on entry team personnel. So we have people in PPE who have gone either into the hot zone, into the hot zone, and now they have had some type of life-threatening situation. When we talked about PPE, we talked about the hazards of heat and medical issues and things like that. They could have an issue with their PPE where now they are exposed to the hazardous material and they're suffering the effects of that. So now they're having a life-threatening situation and we need to get them decontaminated right away in order to get them medical care. That's emergency decontamination. We're just trying to get the most off. So trying to do it quickly, get them out of that suit. Technical or formal decontamination is using chemical or physical methods to thoroughly remove contaminants from responders. It's usually the entry team personnel and their equipment. This is conducted within a formal decontamination line or corridor following a gross decontamination. And we'll talk about gross decontamination here in a little bit. So technical or formal, um, this is slow, methodical, and the purpose is to get all the contaminants off. Thoroughly. Gross decontamination. 
This is quickly removing the worst surface contamination, usually by rinsing with large amounts of water from handheld hose lines, emergency showers, or other water sources. This is, this is what we call down and dirty. Um, you're just trying to get the most worst surface contamination off. Um, number of victims and time constraints do not allow the establishment of an in-depth decontamination process. So that's where we would involve gross decontamination. So we have multiple victims and we need to get them decontaminated. We have a large number of people that need to be decontaminated as quickly as possible. We're gonna set up gross decontamination. You can use gross decontamination for entry team personnel before technical decontamination, use it victims during emergency decontamination and persons requiring mass decontamination. So when we talk mass decontamination, that's when you have a large number of people and you don't have time to run them all through technical decon. Mass decontamination is conducting gross decontamination of multiple people at one time. So you can have two types of gross decontamination. One is a single person, and you can also have it with multiple people. That'd be mass decontamination. You don't do mass technical decontamination. When do we do this? Where the number of victims and time constraints do not allow the establishment of an in-depth decontamination process. Use large volumes of low pressure water to reduce the level of contamination. Secondary decontamination, uh, you take a shower after having completed a technical decontamination. And then definitive decontamination if depending on the product, you have more decontaminating further after technical decontamination. There's patient decontamination. This is decontaminating engineered patients or victims. There's buddy decontamination, performing decontamination between entry team personnel or others, making it easier to rinse difficult to reach areas such as the back and back legs and knees. And there's self-decontamination, conducting emergency decontamination on oneself, usually by rinsing with water or using a blotting or absorption method. So you can get an absorbing pad and just wipe the contaminant off of you. Do it yourself. Isolation and disposal with decontamination. You're going to isolate the contaminated items by collecting them in some fashion. We have special bags with the hazmat team. And then you dispose of them in accordance with applicable regulations and laws. So that's usually done by the remediation or cleanup company. So setting up decontamination. You can never be certain when personnel may have to exit the hot zone. So, uh, so here, this is very important. It's extremely important for decon to be prepared prior to entry into the hot zone. So before you put people in PPE, and send them toward the hot zone, whether or not you plan on them getting in the hot zone or not, you need to have a decontamination plan in place. Not just the plan, the equipment needed to perform decontamination as well. You need people to be able to do it and the equipment to be able to do it. Everything should be ready to decon personnel leaving the hot zone, okay? The decon corridor needs to be established prior to anyone entering the hot zone. Like I said, even if you don't plan on going the hot zone, wind changes direction. You may be in the hot zone when you didn't even expect to be. Make sure you have decon set up before you send people in. So here's some things that might be required for your decontamination setup plastic sheeting or plastic tarps to protect the ground, barrier cones and barrier tape to establish your control zones. People need to know, all right, this is where the warm zone starts. This is where the hot zone starts. Buckets and brushes, a disposal drum. You can put equipment in there that cannot be deconned uh, for proper disposal. A source of water, fire truck with hose, garden sprayer, emergency shower. 
So before entry is main made, these three things need to be in place. Your decon corridor needs to be set up. Your entry team need to know, personnel need to know the location of the corridor and the decon procedure. And you'd have personnel in PPE ready to perform decontamination. Okay. Whoops. Some things to think about when choosing a decon site, accessibility. The people going into the entry, the, the hot zone, your entry team, uh, they're gonna be working. Uh, they could be very exhausted. Um, so they need to be able to get to have access to your decon corridor entry. You need to consider the train and surface material, lighting and electrical supply if you're working at night, drains and waterways that are in your area, where you're gonna get water supply from and weather, especially wind direction. So for example, we got our hazard area in the center. We got our hot zone or exclusion zone out from it. Then we're going to create our decon station and we see where the wind's coming from, from the right, heading to the left. We have our decon area upwind. Okay. See where our safe haven is? So that's where we told our victims on scene to go to if they could. And now we're going to have them, they're still upwind of the hazard, but they're downwind from the command post, the staging area, and decon, decontamination corridor. They're all downwind from those. So now we can just have the people in the safe haven move over to decon and go through decon to exit to the clean area. Okay. Accessibility must be away from hazards, but adjacent to the hot zone. Some crucial time periods to consider for accessibility. Your travel time in the hot zone. How long is it gonna to take to get from the dress out area to the hot zone? How much time they can work in the hot zone? Your travel time back to the decontamination site. And then how much decontamination time you have. So remember, travel time, into the hot zone, working, time back to the decontamination site, and how much time it's going to get through decontamination. That is, if they're on SCBA, that is all time they need air for. Okay. So you have to have this, these entry points and the decontamination corridor in locations where they will still have air to get through decon process. You need to make the corridor visually recognizable. Use barrier tape, the caution tape, the yellow caution tape, safety cones, etc. You need to consider the train and surface material. It ideally slopes toward the hot zone. Now, not an excessive grade, but it needs to not have materials wanting to roll downhill to the cold zone. You can dike around the site to prevent accidental contamination escaping from the area. It's the best if the site has a hard non-surface, non-porous surface to prevent ground contamination. When a hard surface driveway, parking lot, or street is not accessible, some type of impervious covering may be used to cover the ground. That's a plastic tarp, very large plastic tarp. Um, you wouldn't wanna put it on a gravel area. Use covers or sheeting to form the decontamination corridor regardless of whether the surface is porous or not. Lighting and electrical supply, a site illuminated by street lights, flood lights, or other type of permanent lighting reduces the need for portable lighting. So if you put it underneath the street light, um, that'll help out a little bit if you don't have access to portable lighting. Drains and waterways near the site, such as storm and sewer drains, ponds, ditches, and other waterways, don't wanna be, don't wanna be dealing with those. And then also your water supply. 
Make sure you set up the site upwind to prevent the spread of contaminants into clean areas and make every attempt to shield victims from cold winds while they're removing protective cold clothing. So if we have to do this in the winter, we got people working outside in plastic suits and we're using water to wet them down, it's gonna get cold. Um, so we need some type of um, structure to be able to do this and keep people warm and protected from the weather. Do what you can to ensure privacy, uh, provide a private restricted area in which to conduct decontamination. Uh, these are for victims um, who, like we said, you can get the majority of contaminant off by removing their clothes. Use female responders to assist whenever possible when decontaminating women. We're talking about victims. When it comes to responders, they'll have their regular um, uniform street clothes under, in, in their PPE. We're gonna place contaminated clothing and personal items in bags and we're gonna label them whenever possible. We're gonna separate personal effects into clear plastic bags, clearly marked with the person's name and mark all personal effects so that they can be returned to their proper owners after the incident without confusion. So if you're taking people's uh, watches and eyeglasses and purses or whatever, uh, wallets, um, phones, they need to be returned to them possibly later. So here's a diagram of decontamination setting up. We have our hot zone on the left side. Let's start with that. Uh, hot zones on the left side. If you go straight down on the left side, you see your wind direction. So it is the hot zone is downwind from our Our decon is, is down, is upwind from the hot zone. So we're going to move from left to right. Uh, we have a tool drop area. So we put down a tarp, and that's where um, the entry team personnel can put down their tools that they use that are contaminated for decontamination later. And then we have a barrel where we can put, uh, if we used outer gloves and boots, also, we can have on that barrel some absorbent pads where they can wipe off the contaminant before they even start doing decon. And then we get into the diked area. Um, then we got two sides. The upper side is the dirty area. So that's the downwind side. And we have a clean side, which is the upwind side. We also have a flag posted uh, so that everybody knows which way the wind's blowing. So in case we have to rearrange the decontamination corridor, uh, we can do that. Here we example, we have a, if you notice that the decon personnel are all operating on the upwind side. That way, whatever contaminants coming off of the entry team personnel um, is not blowing onto our decon personnel. This is an example of a three pool setup, each chemical, will determine how we decon. So as each entry team personnel goes through each of the pools, they end up into the uh, donning, sorry, doffing area where we have the um, responders, we have decon personnel assisting the entry team personnel in removing their suits. So how are we gonna do this process, this technical decon process? We're gonna wash from head down and we're gonna brush from head down. We're gonna communicate with the entry team member as to the areas of contamination. So if you're an entry team member and you knew that you got contaminated in a certain area, you're gonna communicate that location to your decon personnel so they can concentrate on that area. They're gonna leave as much contamination behind as possible in each pool. <laughs> 
When it comes to doffing chemical protective suits, we're going to use a clean man and a dirty man. So two pure personnel. The dirty man touches the outside of the suit, while the clean man touches only the inside of the suit. Okay. And when PPE is removed, it goes into a bag, like an example picture there. Patient decontamination is necessary whenever victims have been contaminated yet need medical attention. So uh, you can be contaminated and not need medical attention. You are not, this is not patient decontamination. Um, this is just regular decontamination. You're only a patient and need decontamination if you need medical attention. You use the same techniques as other types of decontamination, but give special considerations, excuse me, to the injuries and medical conditions of the victims. So different types of patients. We have ambulatory patients, which are victims who are able to understand directions, talk, and walk unassisted. Most are triaged as minimal or minor. Factors for determining the priority of patients. Okay. So which of the patients do we decon and treat first? So anyone who is closest to the point of release gets high priority. Anyone who is reporting that they were exposed to the hazardous material. Anyone with evidence of contamination on their clothing or skin. Anyone with serious medical symptoms or anybody with conventional injuries will get higher priority than those victims who do not enter any of those categories. So what are you gonna do with ambulatory patients? You're gonna direct them by voice, maybe a PA system for amplification or hand signals to the gross decontamination area away from the high risk areas. We're gonna direct them to remove their clothing down to their underwear. We're gonna place the patient's clothing in trash barrels whenever possible, separating valuable personal effects into clear plastic bags and placing the patient's name or a unique identifying number on the bags whenever possible. So this says remove their clothing down their underwear. This is before they get to a private area because um, eventually we need to get them completely disrobed. We're gonna vacuum brush or wipe all particulate matter off the contaminated patients. We're gonna have the patients close their, close their mouth and eyes. We use handheld sprayers containing tepid water, room temperature or diluted bleach solution. And we're gonna rinse the patient from head to toe for at least one minute and direct them to proceed to the cold zone. So these are patients who are walking and we're gonna just hold, uh, brush any particulate matter Tell them to close their eyes and mouth. We're gonna hose them down for a minute. So non-ambulatory patients are victims who are unconscious, unresponsive, or unable to move unassisted. We're gonna remove them from the high risk area in the quickest way possible and carry them to the edge of the hot zone, bordering the warm zone. We're gonna remove their patient, patient's clothing, cutting it off as necessary down to their underwear. Place the patient's clothes in a trash barrel, separating personal effects into clear plastic bags, as we mentioned before. We're going to vacuum brush or wipe off particulate matter. We're going to close manually their mouth and pinch the nose shut if the patient cannot do so. And we're going to use a handheld spray or a hose line to rinse the patient for a minute, for one minute, beginning with the face and airway and proceeding to open wounds. Make sure that the armpits, genitalia, and the back are also rinsed. We don't want to forget those. They can get forgotten and the material is still there. All surfaces need to be rinsed. We're going to rinse the backboard before transferring the patient to the cold zone, assuming we are carrying them on one. We're going to apply a C collar as soon as possible if a C spine injury is suspected and a collar is available. We're going to determine whether secondary decontamination will be done. If not, the patient should be quickly dried, covered, wrapped in an enclosing blanket, and then carried to the cold zone on a backboard. We're going to scan the patient with detection equipment and report the results to the treatment team if a radiological agent is involved. <laughs> 
uh, scan them with a radiation detector. Transfer the patient to properly protected cold zone personnel who will perform indicated patient care. So here are the indications for emergency decontamination. Uh, remember this is for the entry team personnel, failure of protective equipment, accidental contamination, heat illness or other injury, or any other immediate medical attention required. Some limitations to emergency decon. Does not always totally decontaminate the victim. It also creates contaminated runoff that can harm the environment, environment and other exposures and other people. So here are the steps for emergency decon. We're gonna remove the victim from the contaminated area. We're gonna wash them immediately, any exposed body parts with flooding quantities of water. We're gonna remove the victim's clothing and or PPE rapidly if possible, cutting from the top down in a manner that minimizes the spread of contaminants. We're gonna perform a quick cycle of a head to toe head to toe rinse, wash and rinse, transfer the victim to treatment personnel for assessment, first aid, medical treatment. And we're gonna ensure that ambulance and hospital personnel are told about the contaminant involved. All right, now we got everybody through decon. When do we start taking it down? <clears throat> Once all entry personnel have been decontaminated, decon personnel can, excuse me, begin decontamination. You may use the same process as the entry team, and you will start with the next lowest decon level. So if you have a three pool decon, like in our diagram earlier, the decon personnel team who was working the very first pool will start their decontamination process in the second pool. And the team that was working the second pool will start their decontamination in the first pool or the last pool, third pool. The people in the third pool should not need decontamination. As soon as all personnel, including decon personnel have been decon, your corridor may be disassembled. You want to dispose of remaining equipment in disposal container and place it in the hot zone for later disposal. Place it near the hot zone because you don't want to go in the hot zone. And that is decon and control zones. <laughs>